I'm Ikwe, Nekna Malita, and this is my channel, The Midnight Librarian. Today I will be talking about my April 2021 wrap-up. I don't even know where April went. What happened in April? <laughs> For April, what did I do? I my partner and I played through, continued to play through Halo, the Halo series on Heroic. Fairly big into Halo, he's so, a little more so than I am, <laughs> to the point where he's reading the rereading the books. He does want me to read them. I do want to get more into them because I think the history of that, um, the background of that world is really fascinating, particularly because in April I did find a love for, like, space themed science fiction so I'm really excited about that. I probably won't for a while. Maybe I'll make it a challenge in 2022. We'll see. I didn't finish any art or anything um, in April. I just it's one of those things where I'm inspired. I, I have ideas and it's like I keep repeating the ideas in my mind to be able to stick with them but when I go and actually try to put pencil to paper it's like my hand gets dumb and it's not doing what I want it to do and I think ultimately what I need to do is just keep practicing. Mostly because like when I start doing that and it's not, my hand's not coordinating with my brain, it creates a discouragement of just like I don't have, I'm out of practice, I'm um, no good at this, like and then I get really discouraged. So really it's, I have to, I need to come up with a system to be able to just go outside and do some still lives, get back into it, do some simple drawings first. Um, yeah. So, like I said, didn't do finish anything. I ended up finding my Game Boy Color. Um, and this bit back the little um, battery portion was all encrusted in battery discharge. I must have been in middle school when I first got this. Uh, it was a charger pack. That was connected to it so I had lost this because I had the charger pack and then eventually I had lost the um, the plug-in for the charger pack so I got rid of the charger pack and and for the longest time it just had the batteries just this with duct tape over it <laughs> And I didn't know how long that stayed in there like that, but I found it recently in my closet. I was so happy that I even still have my Game Boy Color. It still has my original Tetris game in it. I was super excited. So what I did was that I cleaned out the, looked it up and cleaned out the battery discharge in here, got new batteries, blew in it a couple times to get the dust out, and now my... I can play Tetris and actually what I was really inspired to do is that Bear from Etu Brody put out a uh, recommendation video regarding uh, Pokemon and it got me really excited and really nostalgic for Pokemon, particularly the first gen and second gen. After that I get real picky about <laughs> Pokemon, I think they got ridiculous. Um, so what I ended up doing actually was purchasing Pokemon Green for my Game Boy. Um, it did come in not too long ago. I haven't played it yet, mostly because I got impatient with <laughs> it coming in. So I ended up purchasing Pokemon Sword for Switch and played through it within a couple, within April. And it was real fun. It was the first Pokemon game that I have ever played completely through. Um, I remember trying to do it on this and just wasn't as interested. I didn't didn't have the attention span. So I think with the Switch and the new graphics, it was just easier to go through. Um, and I still haven't beat it yet. <laughs> I am on, I've been losing to the champion like three times and I'm pouting about it. So I put that aside. <laughs> Um, and have been playing Halo since so we're trying to we're um, Basically waiting for Halo 6 to come out which is supposed to come out in fall 2021 and um, I've been trying to convince my partner to play Legendary with me through all the Halo series. We tried with Halo 1 um, The anniversary edition and we made it to level 3 and it took two and a half hours to get halfway through the level before we're like, 
or exhausted <laughs> that took so long so I have an idea and I kind of want to do it again so <laughs> we'll see how that goes okay so in terms of my books for April I read seven books for the month of April I read two science fictions um one's more both were kind of space opera y one more so than the other the other is more fantasy uh, I also read one historical Asian literature, one thriller mystery, two nonfictions, one a collection of essays and one's a memoir, um, and one graphic novel that's a, a dark humor. In terms of ratings, I had one 2.5 star, one 3 star, one 3.5 star, two four stars, one 4.5 star, and one five star, giving my average rating for the month a 3.79. And then in terms of audience, all of them were adult this year, this, uh, this month. And then what else do I track? Three were own voices, um, two for Asian and one for Native American. And then the total pages for this month's ugh, total amount of pages for the month of April was 2,345. So for the first book that I read in April, um, I actually had started in March and finished up in April, but it's all just counting for April. And that is Persephone Station by St Stina Light. Light. Um, this is a science fiction kind of space opera, more fantasy. Basically, we are on Persephone, which is a backwater planet where it is thought that the indigenous life forms are no longer there. There is no indigenous life on this planet, supposedly, and a particular um, uh, corporation is wanting to get materials exploit materials from this planet. There is one one area in which this planet is habitable <laughs> and barely and we're following a group of mercenary women who are hired to help protect the found, uh, indigenous life that is in fact on this planet and that this corporation is wanting to exploit. It's relatively fun. I had higher hopes for this. What did I rate this? I rated this a three. I had higher hopes for it. it. I love the color of the cover, but after reading the book, um, I don't quite understand who this is supposed to be. And that's one thing that bothers me about books with um, someone on the cover, particularly a character, is that I spend a good amount of time trying to figure out, one, who it is, Two, if it is a main character, I start getting frustrated at the fact that someone's leading me to figure out what their vision of this character is when I just kind of want to figure it out myself. So it's, I can't say for sure who this is supposed to be. This book tried to go diverse in terms of we have a mostly female cast, um, all from different ethnicities. But that was all really, that was the only thing different about their personalities really was their ethnicities. And even then, it wasn't strong enough for me to be able to decipher who was who. And often throughout the book, I forgot who was supposed to be what really. So um, it was really just a little confusing and a little, a little flat. This book also has diversity in terms of LGBTQ plus representation, but again, it has that same problem of it. Like I said, it was, wasn't enough for me to be able to decipher who was who. And it was often made me forget because there, it felt like so much was trying to, this book was trying to do so much that it, the characters felt flat. It also was problematic in terms of that the author has apologized for, um, since, but, um, because it doesn't necessarily pertain to me. I am not the one to accept that apology. But I did find it problematic when a character was able to decipher from visual looks that who was male, who was female, and who was non-binary. As if 
just by looking at someone you can tell what they prefer to be known as <laughs> so it was really a little um uh, no but otherwise the indigenous um life that was on persephone was really entertaining that's ultimately what ended up grip um gripping me to this and making me want to read this book was the first chapter that actually made me really excited and then it kind of just went downhill from there in my opinion the first chapter i thought was really dynamic and really interesting i thought it was something that i would be able to relate to in terms of it's an indigenous um population being exploited by a corporation despite it being on a different planet I feel like I could have related to that and it's like I thought we were going to get more perspectives from these indigenous life forms and we don't. It's mostly these mercenaries um, that are mostly women that I can't remember who's who. So it had an interesting aspect. I liked the, um, the banter in here was relatively funny. Uh, this book claims to be for people who enjoy The Mandalorian and Cowboy Bebop. It's been years since I've watched Cowboy Bebop, so I cannot compare that. I don't think it's like The Mandalorian. I almost want to compare it more to, to Solo, um, that movie. Just because of the banter aspect, I thought was relatively interesting in the mercenary aspect. I don't think it's necessarily like um, Mandalorian. I feel like there's not a whole lot of connection with any of these characters. When I had first read the first chapter of this, I was connected to the indigenous life forms that were being exploited. But then, like I said, we don't get much of their perspective after that. And so therefore, I, it, it loses me. The next book I read for April was The Bonesetter's Daughter by Amy Tan. Now I remember Amy Tan's other work being a required reading and I remember enjoying it. The Joy Luck Club. I remember enjoying that. I can't really recall what it was about now. Um, I would like to reread it but the, the Bonesetter's Daughter was available through my library. They were following Ruth Young who is um, Chinese American. Her mother um, immigrated from China and they kind of have a stressful relationship in terms of Ruth really just not being able to understand her mother and their and like some of her superstitions or cautions throughout her life there was also just a lot of turmoil while she was growing up in San Francisco that Ruth didn't understand why she had and she thought it was all because of her mother so as um, Ruth is getting older, so is her mother, and her mother is starting to show signs of dementia, and Ruth is getting really worried about it as her mother, Lu Ling, is starting to say some information about herself that Ruth doesn't know to be true. So Ruth ends up finding a stack of papers that her mother ended up writing for her. It is Lu Ling's history. It is how her story. Uh, unfortunately, Ruth does not quite remember how to doesn't know how to read Chinese and ends up needing help with it learning these stories from her mother uh, Ruth starts to understand more of her mother's past and have a better connection with her it was a really it was a decent story I enjoyed it I <laughs> it's not something I was expecting I was kind of expecting like I don't know I don't know what I was expecting really but it was fun and it was interesting. It's something that I I have enjoyed Amy Tan's writing and I hope to enjoy more of her writing. I think I gave this 3.5 stars. Content warning for war and misogyny, suicide, threat, mention, um, mention of self-harm, um, dementia, uh, immigration. Um, just bear all those in mind before going into this book. I thought it was a really nice in terms of reflecting on that everyone has their own story and reasons for doing what they do. There was a particular portion in this book that I thought fairly cringy just because of the situation not so much of the writing and I'm not a big fan of cringe. <laughs> um, I, I just am not um, but there was a particular memory in here so we get 
not only Lu Ling's story, but part of Ruth's past as well as we try and f we figure out how their dynamic works and um, what how it goes wrong. And there was just one particular memory with Ruth that I was just like, oh my god. And it just made me want to so, so much advocate for proper sexual education in schools. <laughs> um, because, oh my god. But yeah. Which we should be advocating for anyway, but this one was just like, oh my god, what are we teaching? So... Yeah, uh, like I said, it was a decent story. The next book I read was Girl 11 by Amy Suter Clark. I have a full review up uh, of this um, that I will link above as well as put in the description down below. And basically this is a mystery thriller where we are following El Carrillo, who it used to be a social service, social services under for children and ends up um, leaving her jobs to be able to create a podcast. This podcast, a true true crime podcast that focuses on missing and murdered children, ends up tackling her white whale of sorts where she um, features, her whole, her new season features the countdown killer, mass kidnapper slash murderer in the Twin Cities area in the late 1990s. He ended up kidnapping and murdering like eight, eight young women and girls um, and he was never caught. The last girl that he kidnapped, she actually got away and but wasn't able for able to help in the capture of the countdown killer. So when someone contacts Elle to give her a tip on who the countdown killer might be, she tries to meet up with um, this person only to find them murdered. So, and she starts to believe that the countdown killer is back. This book was fairly interesting. It ha very much had like, it reminded me of The Night Swim with uh, Michelle McNamara's I'll Be Gone in the Dark, that kind of element to it. Um, I thought the diversity in here was a little more believable. Um, and integrated. I wish there was more to it though because I didn't, there's certain aspects of this book where we start to see relationships shake and like really stress with Elle and there's just not enough for me of a connection to her other, um, to, in these relationships for me to be caught, like to me, for me to be worried about oh, what would happen if these relationships crumbled. Elle Castillo herself is white, as is Amy Suter Clark, um, so she's telling it from that perspective, but there's statements in there that she understands some of the hardships that people of color go through, um, which is nice in a way of just like recognizing that. I saw that other reviews had it that it seemed very peachy, but I think it's just nice to have in books on occasion of just like just little reminders because I thought some of it um was actually really well integrated yeah if you want to see more of my review on that um check that out ultimately I gave that 2.5 stars the next book I read I actually haven't hauled this yet um but I plan to at some point but that is World of Wonders in Praise of Fireflies, Will Sharks, and Other Astonishments by Amy Nezukuma <laughs> I have this down, damn it. Nez Um, This is essentially a collection of essays by Amy. Um, I picked this up on a whim at my local bookstore when I, I think I was picking something up for someone else and saw this and thought it looked really... Actually, I th it kind of has this like classic feel to it with the illustrations and I believe the illustrations are done by, let me see, uh, by Fumi Mini Naka, Nakamura. Um, but there's multiple illustrations within the book as well. But just this cover just reminded me of something classic. Like, I believe this was published in 2020, but it almost looks and should, 
Like it makes me think that it should smell like an old book and it doesn't. <laughs> um, but this was really just kind of a sweet little book. Um, Amy talks about multiple different animals like the vampire squid and whale sharks as well as um, plants like tashminots or mimosa pudicas um, and how they've affected her life in some way or how she reflects on them um, about her life in some way. It was just really nice that I believe Amy Nezhu I apologize if I'm completely just messing this pronunciation up. Nezu, Nezuku Mata, Nezuku Matatil, um, is, she grew up a little all, all over the place in America. Um, her family moved a lot, but I believe her parents are from India and she spent, her, she herself spends a lot of time um, traveling back and forth from the United States to India and it was just really just fun um, like I said um, Fumi, Mini, Fumi Mini Nakamura's illustrations are within the book as well so let me vampire squid so yeah it was just the illustrations spoke to me and that spoke to me uh inspired me just because i enjoy scientific illustrations um the book itself was really meaningful i feel like there was a couple of stories essays in particular that really stood out to me particularly Pe uh, peacock um the axolotl and there was another one. there was like multiple and it just kind of Amy talks about like the different um, prejudices that she's had to deal with in America as well as just um, some of the things that she's had to teach her children, what her mother had to teach her, um, what she kind of had to grow up knowing. But yeah, I thought this was a really impactful book. I gave it 4.5 stars. I really enjoyed it. It was a nice little book. I thought like I think I read like a couple chapters a night. It was just really nice and I also enjoy little micro histories about animals and plants and stuff so it was really fun. This also unexpectedly works for the Buzzwordathon theme for April which was uh, space, outer space themed, so world. I chose for to read for the Buzz um, Wordathon for April was The Long Way to a Strange Angry, The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. Uh, so I enjoyed this to the point where I immediately bought the rest of the series. So, and I didn't want to wait for the UK versions and actually I struggled to try to figure out if I wanted to stay with the UK versions of this book um, or go with the US editions. And ultimately, I think they are both fantastic in their own way. This is very, like, it almost feels to me like they're kind of poking fun at sci-fi in a bit, a little bit. It also reminds me of um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy type. Um, it's just very, seems like old school science fiction-y. This is more kind of like enchanting in a way, um, very, it's almost very poetic and I really kind of, I think it fits as well. I think both of these fit. Um, I'll have to do <laughs> a series on book covers that you could go either way with. Um, but ultimately I did end up picking up all of the US editions because I didn't want to wait for the UK editions to get here. But The Long Way to a Strange Angry Planet by Becky Chambers is a science fiction space opera. We, in this first one, and these are more like companions, um, but in this first one, um, we follow Rosemary Harper, who ends up joining the crew of the Wayfarer, which is a ship that board, that creates like, I almost want to say black holes, but they create like these tunnels within space so that it doesn't take as long to travel from one area of space to another. Rosemary has some dark history she doesn't want anyone to know about. She's tried very hard to make it so that her name isn't recognizable and that she's not connected 
to her back to her home planet of Mars. And we kind of followed the wafer as they get a huge um, commission to bore a particular hole near a backwater planet that just recently um, decided to join this kind of like, I almost want to call it the Space Senate in terms of um, coming to some kind of agreement. So, but it's going to take a while for them to even get over there because there's no easily accessible um, travel to get there. So they have, to, it takes them a while to get there. And during that time, we learn about the Wayfarer crew. This is very much very uh, character driven, which I wasn't sure about going into this, but I, after reading it, I absolutely loved it. Becky Chambers made me fall in love and care for each crew member on the Wayfarer, which I didn't think was possible. <laughs> um, I typically don't like multi-perspective books, but this one was very well done in my opinion. And yeah, I ultimately just it really loved it. And it made me think that space is more than just a big empty scary thing that I don't ever really want to think about. It's more, this book made it seem more like a comforting blanket and I was excited to want to delve more into space themed science fiction books. So yeah, <laughs> I think that this, honestly, this book may be one of my favorites of all time or of the year. I'm not quite sure yet. I feel like it's too soon to say, but it is definitely one of my favorites. And I can't wait to delve deeper into the series. Like I said, these are more of like, from what I understand, companions. Um, in terms of we follow, they're companions, but they're also sequels. So like we follow a different perspective and the next one is the is a closed and common orbit but the character we're following I feel like would give spoilers if you haven't read this one yet so bear that in mind. Uh, my next book is also kind of I haven't hauled yet and actually I, I once again bought it on a whim um, at my local bookstore. I've seen these <laughs> on Facebook these kind of like webtoons um, and I guess they turned them into a book which I'm not mad about. I'm actually really ha happy for it. I'm, I'm gonna say the name wrong. I know it but it's Belzebub's um, and essentially this is a graphic novel basically a compilation of it describes itself as a true cult documentary focusing on everyday challenges a family life, raising kids, getting your black metal band off the ground, summoning demons, you know how it is, um, <laughs> by J.P. Ahonen. Um, <laughs> and basically we're following this black metal band as well as, uh, I believe the singer slash guitarist, uh, family where they're kind of, I think, uh, Satanists. <laughs> And all about like raising demons and um, uh, it's kind of very much dark humor. There's some aspects in here that probably won't work for everybody um, as it kind of talks about um, body mutilation in terms of like and threats. Um, but I think it's relatively funny. Like I said, I had enjoyed finding the web comics kind of this like goth slice of life humor that's a little dark at times it's just really fun to me um what did I give this I think I gave this four stars <laughs> but it was just a fun little read it very much almost reminds me of the Adams Family um meets the Aussies <laughs> but in comic book form so and my last read of the month was In My Own Moccasins by Helen Knott this was the book chosen for the month of April for Erin and Danny's book club. Uh, for the year of 2021, Erin and Danny have created a their book club and are challenging themselves as well as anyone who wants to join to read Indigenous memoirs. And for April, it was Helen Knott's um, and My Own Moccasins. This 
is a very raw book. Um, we follow Helen not as she is struggling with um, alcohol abuse and drug addiction as she's trying to essentially numb herself from her past which that is does consist of sexual assault and we follow her as she heals not only from the addiction but her facing her history and trying to improve upon her life and the struggles she has um, as she relapses and tries to get back out it's very very raw this is not in it um, it even says I think in the beginning this is not like an introduction to oh okay um It even has a content warning saying that this memoir has content related to addiction and sexual violence. It is sometimes graphic and can be triggering for readers if you are a survivor of sexual violence, addiction, intergenerational trauma, and find yourself triggered, please be gentle with yourself. And of course names have been changed to protect um, them and it just kind of says right off the bat that this should not be considered your introductory into missing murdered and um indigenous women or um an indigenous woman's life this is hell on that story like i said it was raw it was definitely impactful i it was a little jarring to get into but once i got into it like i ate it up essentially this was I don't it's I feel seen not that I've had like similar history to her at all but having the same like dysphoria of not being able to connect with the culture because of how and like just different aspects of it and really like I don't know Helen not what Helen not does there's a forward in here by Eden Robinson who wrote the um, trickster trilogy um but it is like almost it's almost it lets me relax my shoulders and the fact that knowing that I am not the only one that suffers from dysphoria of my culture that is not the only one that is constantly struggling to learn and I feel like particularly during COVID as we're all kind of isolated we tend to forget that that there is multiple not only in our within our own culture but multiple cultures that have this problem of being able to reconnect with their culture and have are trying to break back into it only to met with resistance whether it's from our our own people trying to gatekeep or from those on the outside um either thinking that we need to uphold a certain standard so it, it's definitely so <sighs> it's very challenging in terms of looking in on myself as helen not is trying to heal herself so there's different aspects of it that i'm like huh that is definitely thought provoking i'm hoping to have more thoughts about this book after aaron and denny's um discussion um that i hope to be a part of later so yeah uh, i think i give this four stars for now but it might change i feel like it's iffy right now so yes that's what i got through <laughs> plus um girl 11 plus amy tan's book the bonesetter's daughter um for the month of april if you've read any of these i'd love to hear your opinions on them please no spoilers otherwise if you've made it this far be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you haven't already be sure to subscribe hit the little bell icon to get notified when i post more content um yeah check out my um my raise awareness links down in the description down below um i hope that you are in the mental mindset to enjoy your reading and i will talk to you again soon Ciao.